Okay, uh, Bob will be giving us our sermon on Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 3, 1 through 7. Thank you. I know we have a little smaller crowd, but it's still nice outside and the weather's good, right? Amen. All right. So um, as you're reading, this is called the section that I've been preaching through, and this is the last little section. They're called household codes. If you didn't know, that's a household code. And the one we're on is about the famous wives being subject to their husbands. So it's pretty sensitive in this text, but I'm going to start off with just a line or a quote that I read that really <laughs> stuck out to me, okay? Dear God, first bless me and bless our church as we go over this sermon and bless our audience that's listening online. Um, I thank you for them and, um, and God, God's people said, Amen. Amen. So when you read the three household codes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13, all the way through the text today from chapter 3, verse 7, all of them seem to suggest that Christians who submit voluntarily and to do so in silence, in other words, by not saying anything, even to the point of persecution, and even death is highly valued in God's, in God's sight. When you read the text, you can't get away from that. So, one author even stated this in the text that we're reading today about wives being silent or being submissive to the point where they could win over their husbands by, be, by just their character without saying a word. And here's what the author stated. He said, Peter's point is not to forbid verbal testimony or the wives speaking to their husbands and trying to convert them. That's not his point. But to suggest that such testimony is really not necessary and even sometimes not helpful. So if you think about that, in other words, here's another way to say it, a real simple way, because this is sensitive. And this is for us all. Evangelisms without, evangelism without words is the best approach to win people. Ever heard that before? That's actually a famous say, saying from St. Francis of Assisi. He was a famous monk in about 1000 AD, and he had a movement that he wanted to evangelize without saying a word. He didn't mean not to say anything, but do it by example first. So his famous quote was this, preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. So, you know what he's saying. Is that, I guess, when you read this text, especially the one we're on right now, is that what Peter's saying? Preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. That's hard for a preacher <laughs> to agree with. Think about it. Preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. What am I doing right now? All I do is use words. <laughs> So I have, to re I have to change my way of thinking. In other words, practice what you preach is what he's saying. And so here's, here's my point of view on this text, okay? Just my thesis statement or takeaway is this. That voluntary submission, even to the point of silence, sets the stage for evangelism. Does that make sense? Voluntary submission by our conduct, by our behavior, will set the stage for someone who's listening and looking at our lives to be even receptive enough to listen to you. So that's the point I think Peter's making. Now, there's a problem, though, and this is what brought up in the text. Okay, so the problem is this. In the Christian household in the time of 1 Peter, Whatever was going on, households, in other words, wives and slaves, were expected to submit to the patriarch, to the male figure of the home, and sometimes even worship their gods. And the reason why I wanted to state that, because that may be behind why Peter says what he says. So the women, the slaves, were expected to submit to the patriarch, and worship his gods. And to this, if that was the worldview, Peter gives some timely advice. And so I want to give a quick review of what Peter is not saying, okay? Because that's, are you saying, Peter, that 
I have to obey my master and worship as gods, but I, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. So when you read the text from that point of view, it, get, it makes sense when I give you these verses. Okay, so a quick review of the three household codes. The first one is the ones where he talks about being submissive to the governors and supreme authorities in chapter 2, verse 13. And I'll just read it. In 2.13, he says, Submit yourselves, and notice what he says right away as a disclaimer. For the Lord's sake, to every human authority. And if you recall, that was a real subversive way of Peter calling emperors and governors. He wasn't calling them gods. He was calling them what? Human authorities. They, they are human after all. So what Peter was really saying is what Jesus said. Give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God. And it was a real fine line in that first little section between honoring the emperor or honoring people and worshiping them. There is a difference. So we are to honor our presidents. We are to honor our governors. We are to honor even in the church our leaders, but we don't worship them. So keep that in mind as we get to the text on the women and their husbands. The next one is slaves in verse 18. A quick review of the slaves. Notice the, the wording and the subversive language that Peter uses to make sure that there is that fine line between honoring and worshiping your master. Verse 18, slaves. And the first thing he says, in reverent fear of God. So who are we to fear first and foremost? It's the God of heaven. He's the one we worship. He's the one we fear. And when we follow him, it makes it easier to worship others. Or not worship, but to follow others. Because we do so because of Christ. So he says, slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. And then that famous saying, not only to those who are nice and, and considerate, but those who are harsh. So think about that. That's why I stated at the beginning, it seems like Peter is saying, to do this voluntarily and to do so in silence, even to the point of persecution and death is highly valued. And then he says, this is commendable before God if you receive an unjust beating for actually trying to do something good, that God sees it. And then the famous example he gives is last week's sermon. To this you were called. Think about Jesus. To this you were called. Did he have to go to Jerusalem and die on the cross? Did he do so by being forced to do so? He voluntarily did it because he had the heart of a servant. Verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And then notice the silence part of it. I'm just going to read 23b, the second part. When he suffered, and I believe he's talking about the trial here, not necessarily on the cross, but the trial before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate. When he suffered, he made no threats. He, instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. So that's a quick review of three of the household texts. His supreme authorities, slaves to masters, and now Jesus doing it. And then we get into this verse. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up, because the first thing that Peter writes is, in the same way, and what is he, who is he referring to? He's probably referring to Jesus. In the same way as Jesus, wives submit to your own husbands. Think about that in the same way. One disclaimer I had to bring out on this text, I did a couple weeks ago, um, saying that this text is not really real popular among some Christian scholars because when people in the, I guess, the egalitarian point of view where women are equal the women's lib movement or feminists say wait a second are you saying I'm to submit and not say anything when we're in America and we're in universities and we're supposed to speak so do you, Peter is not saying that okay and he's also not saying what I heard what happened in one of the churches in another culture I won't say what culture to single them out because this could happen on our own he's not saying that I've heard this, that some good Christian men have used these verses to justify um, abusing their wives, hitting them, putting them in submission. Because the scripture they use for that is, what credit, 
what credit is it to you if you suffer a beating for doing wrong? But if you suffer unjustly and endure it, this is commendable before God. So they've used that verse to justify, I can hit my wife. And that's not what Peter is saying either. Okay? I wanted to get those two disclaimers because I've heard that preached before. And believe me, I witnessed in one country where I remember in going to church like this that if you weren't quiet, they had sticks. And it was in a part of the world that uh, in South America, they had sticks going around and put you in submission pretty quick. So people behaved in church. But that has happened. I witnessed that. I never forgot that. I was a young Christian at the time. So that's not what Peter's saying. So I do want, I did want to show that as a disclaimer or state that. So ultimately, what Peter is saying is this, that Christians are voluntary to submit and sometimes we're expected to submit, but we are liberated to love each other. We are liberated to be a witness. And that's what Peter is saying. In other words, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. That's what he's telling a Christian wife that may not be married to a man that's a believer yet, or maybe a believer that's kind of backsliding. And he's saying, you really have a profound in impact. So before you throw in the towel and give up on your husband or vice versa, this is what he says. Here's his timely word. Now let's read it from that point of view. Before you give in the towel, listen to Peter's words. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And look at the reason why. Here's the real reason. So that if any of them do not believe, and in Greek it says, if any of them are disobedient, and not to her, but to the word. Look what it says. If anyone do not believe the word, disobedient to God's word, which is Christ. You and I both know that we can't force evangelism upon anyone, right? Those of you listening, you know if someone would tell you, preach the gospel, and here it is, and repent and be believed, you're not going to do that. But if, you, if someone serves you and is an example, or at least tries to be an example and shows the love of Christ like a wife does for her husband, hoping that they can be won over, that's what Peter is suggesting here. That's what he's stating Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves. And it's in, in Greek, the word submit is not in the active voice. It's in the passive voice. And that doesn't seem like much to you, but the passive means be submissive voluntarily. That's really what it means. Or in the middle voice, submit yourselves voluntarily. Because Christ did it. You can do it. It's a conscious choice to say, okay, I'm going to hold back today. And I'm going to try and serve in a godly way for a purpose. And the purpose, again, is so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words. And look what he says, by the behavior of their wives. Isn't that a powerful, powerful verse? So here's the, here's the statement again. Preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. So that was my point A, being submissive, uh, subjection voluntary, voluntarily is the first point he's trying to make. Another little disclaimer, remember I said voluntary submission sets the stage for evangelism because ultimately when you're in a household with someone, you're going to speak, right? So look in chapter 3, verse 15. As he comes out of these household codes and he's dressing the whole church, here's what he says. When you do submit and your conduct is right, I think it softens the person or the listener's heart. And in this case, it was one of the spouse's husbands. And then in verse 15, he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And then he says a famous statement, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, asks you to give the reason for the hope you have you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. That deserves a second reading. But in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. 
So start with our, I guess, our actions and our attitudes. And then when you see the person is receptive, then it's time to speak. And that's what I believe Peter is getting to, that he's saying our behavior and the way the world sees it is the first and foremost point of evangelism. That's called presence evangelism, just being there and trying to be the best we can. Now, I love the examples he gives. The next, he just goes into a great example. So I don't even have to give my own illustration. This illustration is great. Look at verse 3. And I know this is important because now that I'm on YouTube, I bought a different pair of glasses so my glasses won't get shaded when I preach, if you noticed, because I look like Jim Jones. And I don't want to be Jim Jones if you ever know who he is. Someone told me. The other thing is I actually comb my hair better because I know I'm online and my hair looks bad. So I, and I set it up right. So beauty is important, okay, even for a man. Sorry, as macho men, you know. So. And we, we pay attention to that, and especially for women, because look what the example he gives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment. That's important, right? Those of you that are beautiful and get duded up or dressed up, that's important. We all want to do that, right? I think that's an important trait to have. And when people compliment you, your looks or your, you know, you're a beautiful person, look at your eyes. That's important. That's a great compliment. But Peter says, your beauty should not come from the outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles or wearing of gold jewelry, jewelry and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unbeauty, unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. And then he justifies it, which is of great worth in God's sight. So if you're not feeling outwardly perfect, What's beautiful in God's sight is a beautiful inward spirit. Amen? And that preaches to all of us. So that's point number two. So just a quick review. Be in subjection voluntarily for a purpose of winning um, someone. Preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. And then he gives the example of beauty, how it looks in God's eyes. Not necessarily the way we look externally, but how we are internally. And then he continues on. I call this a little chiastic thing, statement. It's like a A, B, and now he goes back to B again. And he gives another example of beauty. And he goes back to the Old Testament and tells a beautiful story. And he says, and this is the way the holy women in the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. And he gives the example of Sarah. And notice how it starts. I didn't catch this till I read this carefully. If you look at verse 5b, the second part, it, second part of it, look what it says. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. It's the same exact wording as it started in verse 1. So it's a, like a little sandwich. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, verse 1. And then in verse 5b, they submitted themselves to their own husbands. It's actually the same exact wording in Greek. We change the pronouns in this one because he's talking about Sarah and her husband, but it's the same thing. So he's kind of making sure that they don't miss this point. And the point he gives here, submit yourselves voluntarily again. And here's the prime example. Like Sarah. And it's an interesting little play on words. And it comes back to my initial statement that these Household codes seem to suggest that Christians who submit voluntarily and do so in silence, even to the point of persecution and death, is highly valued. But there is a difference between honoring and worshiping, even your own husband. And I want you to notice that key difference here. Submit yourselves voluntarily. They submit themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham. And I thought this was interesting and called him her Lord. So Peter's touching upon something here that, is he saying that husbands are equal to the Lord Jesus? He does make a disclaimer in verse 7, by the way, okay? He called him her Lord, and then he gives the encouragement. You are her daughters 
if you do what is right, and then he states a statement that kind of brings us back to that point. Husbands are to be honored, but they are not to be worshipped. Um, you are daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. I thought it was interesting. Why would they be fearful? And that's why I brought up the point at the beginning that in this culture, the context is that households, women in particular here, were expected to submit to the patriarch and maybe even to their gods. And if they challenged it and say, hey, I'm a Christian now and I don't worship your God, that caused tension in the household. And what Peter is saying, love them, serve them, be an example, wash their feet, do this, and vice versa. Wives or husbands, do that to your wives. And if you don't believe that, look at verse 7. He exhorts the, the men and the husbands, husbands in the same way. There's that word again, the same way as who? Not the wives of Jesus. Be considerate. As you live with your wives, treat them with, and the word is honor. Honor your wives. They're not gods, but you're still supposed to honor them. And then he says, as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. You know, today I woke up and I was actually happy to be alive. <laughs> happy to be just getting up and say, you know, today's a beautiful day. So it's a gracious gift, life that we live right now sitting here. I know sometimes life could be hard and we can get headaches and you know what I mean, but it's a, it's a gift, okay? <laughs> Got you laughing there, okay? Uh, <laughs> Gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. And I don't want to preach on that verse because that's a whole other sermon, but anyways, do you get it? I mean, voluntary submission is awesome if you do it for the right reasons and you're trying to win people in. That's a great, great ministry to our household, our society, and to the world. And that's what the household codes are really saying. That when we do this, when we submit voluntarily, even in silent submission to what's going on in maybe United States right now, and we try and do the right thing, people watch us. And they see our example. So three takeaways and we're done. Okay. Wives and husbands and all of us really are asked to submit voluntarily. You're not coerced to be a Christian. So that an unbelieving husband in this case will be won over by the conduct of your life. Amen. Our conduct means a big thing. Number two, the importance of conduct is impressed throughout the whole letter of 1 Peter. And I'm going to give you all the quick verses real quick. 115, be holy because I am holy. 212, live such good lives among pagans that when they see your good deeds, they will give praise to your Father in heaven. That's my paraphrase, 212. Um, 3.2, I just read that, 3.2, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, they will be won over. 16 and 17 and 4.19, you could read those on your own. It all talks about our conduct does make an impression. So that's the second takeaway. The third one is, so the saying, preach the gospel, use words of the, if necessary, is a good way to view 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, have you heard the phrase, this is how I end it, a picture is worth a thousand words? Christ dying on the cross didn't have to say anything. But that picture is worth a thousand words. So voluntary submission sets the stage for evangelism, just as our Savior dying on the cross set the stage for the resurrection. Amen. That gave me hope and the chills. May God bless you. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And Mike will sing a song of invitation. It's number 961. 991. Yep, 991. God bless you.